Okay, that is enough from me for now. Uh, let's introduce our first speaker of the hour. We have Galen Rosenrax joining us. She is a marine scientist, explorer, photographer, and filmmaker. She was always fascinated with the marine world. She began diving at 14 and has continued exploring our ocean ecosystems. Recently, she was the expedition biologist for an expedition using submarines to explore the bottom of the Blue Hole in Belize with Sir Richard Branson and Fabian Cousteau. So pretty darn good company. Um, her latest film project on sperm whales in Dominica, Finding Feisty, was recently featured on the cover of the June-July 2020 issue of Outside Magazine. So I am going to bring Galen in with us now. Hi, Galen. How you doing? Hi, Joe. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's always great to see you. I think I think you've probably done about a dozen Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants events, probably since 2015. So it's always great to have you and your dedication to outreach for classrooms is amazing so thank you for everything you've done for us over the years oh my pleasure it's been so fun all right well Galen, i'm gonna let you take over for a little bit and then we'll do a little q a action okay sounds good i am going to do a quick screen share thank you everyone for tuning in on this uh af sunday afternoon um i'm really excited to be sharing some fun adventures so here we go um so here I am in a with a white shark behind me. It's probably my favorite um, portrait that I have or headshot that I like to use. Um, and uh, here I am on the Bering Sea. So we're going to talk a little bit about doing science at sea um, to this afternoon. I'm going to take you on a journey to a few of my favorite places. I've been on expeditions. I've been on expeditions all over the world. I started my career working in the Antarctic um, on this icebreaker. Um, it was, you know, trial by fire, really crazy rough weather. Um, and I was a scientist. And I thought I'd be a research scientist forever. We were doing all sorts of cool research. We were down in the winter, early winter, and um, surrounded by ice. And I was the low man on the totem pole just out of undergrad, under out of university. And I was cleaning nets and looking at two of my favorite creatures, some of my favorite creatures, um, krill and copepods and all the zooplankton that live there, the basis of the food chain, the keystone species down there. So really cool work, really beautiful to, uh, to be down in that environment and really a great launching uh, expedition for the rest of my studies as I went forward. So I took that and here I am. Um, the one time we got off the ship in the two months that we were down there um, and I saw an elephant seal and a Delhi penguin. The Delhi penguins actually eat the krill. So we were looking at the whole ecosystem and really looking at big picture science on a big ship, big research, really just incredible. And that sort of set the groundwork and the tone for the rest of my career, because I sort of learned about everything and how everything was linked together and made me want to learn about the big picture of what's happening to our planet. Then I switched gears a little bit because I love fish and I love big fish and I love the open ocean. So I started working on bluefin tuna, which is my favorite fish in the ocean. Um, and why do we love them? Well, they're really cool fish. They're endothermic. They can keep their bodies warm in cold water, um, but they've been important throughout time. Most people think about them when they think about sashimi and fish that sell for millions of dollars. But throughout time, here are some ancient Greek coins. They've been really important and valued in societies. But what were we doing? Well, I was back in cold water um, and we were catching these fish. So I've been a lifelong fisherman, um, very conservation minded in my fishing. So this was a really great way of fusing my love of fishing and being on the ocean with science. So we would catch these fish, we would bring them on board. Here's a bluefin. Uh, so they're really big too, which is really cool. And then we would put tags in them. So we would put little hard drive tags here. I'm holding one of the tags. It would go inside the body of the fish and it records their internal body temperature and where it's going. And we can learn everything about where this fish's life history. So what's the life history? It's where it's going, what it's eating, when it's having babies and all of those really cool, important things. And we can learn that from putting these tags into these fish. We also use satellite tags, so lots of really cool technology that we're doing. So we put these, these are external tags, and they're also collecting incredible data, not just about the fish, but about the ocean around the fish. So we can really learn about big picture ecosystem science again, and how everything is linked together. Then once the surgery is done, it takes about three minutes. It goes out the door and starts collecting all of this crazy, amazing data. And why is it so cool to put these tags on a bluefin tuna? Because they go 
everywhere in the Atlantic Ocean. So here are three fish that we tagged in North Carolina. And as you can see, they crossed the Atlantic Ocean. So not only do we find out that the fish were crossing the Atlantic Ocean, but we learned about the ocean all along that pathway. So really cool science. And then they're just really big, powerful fish. So this is one of my favorite pictures that I took of a bluefin busting through the water in uh, Nova Scotia. And then also breaching. It's a thousand pound fish jumping out of the water. So we learned so much about this fish and why is it important? Because we want to keep them in the ocean. And in order to keep them in the ocean, we need to learn about where they're going, why they're going, where they're going, and really looking at all of these things, especially in our changing planet. But as I was doing this, I was looking around and there were so many great scientists doing incredible work and we were learning so much. I kind of decided, well, maybe I want to tell these stories. So I love the science and I still do a lot of science, but then I really wanted to amplify the voices of all of my colleagues and all of my friends who were saying, hey, I'm learning this, but I wanted everybody to know about it. I also got this, I just, it was a total change of pace and I got this fortune cookie and it was about courage and it said real courage is moving forward when the outcome is uncertain. And I didn't know what I was gonna do. I thought I was gonna be a research scientist my whole life. But then I ended up on this big ship back in the ice and I started my company, Global Ocean Exploration. And with this company, I now go on expeditions all over and I collaborate with scientists and we tell these incredible stories of ecosystem science, climate change, and what's happening to our planet and what scientists are doing to understand these changes. So I ended up in the Bering Sea. So I started out working in the Antarctic and then I went up to the Arctic. And so here's the ship parked in the ice. So here's the Bering Sea for anyone who doesn't know if anybody watches Deadliest Catch. Well, they'll have seen um, those rough, crazy seas up there when they're going for the king crab. So we flew into this little tiny island, St. Paul Island. And then I got on the ship by a helicopter and we started heading north into the ice. So here we are heading north into the ice. I love being in sea ice. My two favorite things are big fish and sea ice. It's just something that captivates my imagination and it's so unique, right? So here we are. Ship science is 24 hours a day. It's snowed every day on these expeditions. It was cold and windy and it was definitely a challenge. But again, we were looking at big ecosystem science. So we were looking at the plankton, so dragging plankton nets, looking at krill and copepods. And then here though, I was playing a different role. I had a camera in my hand to document all of this. We were looking at what was going on on the seafloor. This is a multi-core. It was taking sediment cores on the bottom. We were looking at water and really getting a profile because it's a very important ecosystem for commercial fisheries. So not only does it have extremely important value just as an ecosystem to keep healthy, but we also are taking a lot of the fish and crabs that we eat out of this system. So we needed to understand what's gonna happen when there's no ice left because seasonal sea ice is super important in this ecosystem. Lots of really cool instruments, lots of cutting edge technology. And as we got farther and farther north, we got into thicker and thicker ice until we were so in such thick ice, I actually was off the ice holding up the ship because I am that strong. And we were drilling ice cores to look at ice algae. So this is seasonal sea ice. And what was going to happen is in the spring, all of this ice is going to melt and that algae is going to get into the water and be food for all of the plankton. And then we're going to have these great blooms and lots of productivity and all of the animals are going to feed off of that. But what's going to happen as we warm up and we're not going to have this seasonal sea ice, it's going to totally alter this ecosystem. In fact, where you saw that picture of me standing on the ice, that hasn't been covered in ice now for a number of years. So very dramatic changes happening. And that's why it's so important to document everything. Once we finish doing the science though, we pull out of our parking spot and we see really cool things like walruses. Um, here are two of my favorites. These are the closest we got. One thing about being on a ship is you see a lot of cool stuff because you're going by them really, like you're going by a lot of places, but you never really get up close and personal. So this was pretty cool to get this close. And they were just looking at the big red ship saying, what's going on? So with thick ice, just newly forming ice, it's an absolute, like this is a frozen ocean and we're not gonna have a frozen ocean in the future. And that's pretty terrifying. So all sorts of really interesting ice formations as we're going through. And this was the Northern part of it. This is actually in the Northwest passages in Canada and just really incredibly beautiful as this newly forming ice was 
um, coming into the winter. So then I'm going to switch gears and we're going to go someplace really warm, but we're still talking about climate change. We're talking about what's happening with our warming ocean. So we know that there is less seasonal sea ice now in the Arctic and mo less multi-year ice because it's melting, but also in coral reef ecosystems, we know that climate change and warming is tremendously affecting this environment. And so, well, what does that mean, right? So I set out, I was working with a team of scientists in Palau, and I made a film about their work called Coral Glimmer of Hope. It's available on YouTube, so please check it out. Um, and I got to go to Palau, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world, very forward thinking about conservation, and they know how important it is to understand this complex ecosystem. Now, Palau is super unique, too, because they've got these incredible offshore systems, right? So where the, we think about the crazy, beautiful coral reefs, the colors and the diversity, so many types of corals, so many types of fish. There's a lot of big predators, sharks and everything in Palau. So what these scientists were doing is they were taking samples of these corals, bringing them back to the lab. And so here's my office while we were in Palau, beautiful reefs. But then there's another system in Palau, these inshore coral reefs that are absolutely incredible. So now what's the difference? The offshore reefs have these reefs have these cooler water and the inshore reefs are warm. It's like almost like a bathtub. It's so warm. But as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of diversity, a tremendous number of corals that are in that's in this environment. So what these scientists were doing is they're trying to understand how these corals are surviving in these two different habitats when they're the same species. What are they doing? What are the trade-offs? In order to understand, well, when the offshore reef is warm in the future, will these corals survive? And trying to understand that on a molecular level, so on the smallest scale that you can understand stuff. And so it's all about symbiotic algae. So there's algae that lives within the corals, and that's how they're figuring it out. So absolutely incredibly beautiful, but again, trying to understand what's gonna happen to these reefs with our changing planet. So then, as Joe mentioned, I was really lucky to be a part of this expedition into the blue hole. So now we're gonna go into the bottom of the ocean into a totally different environment. And here's the blue hole in Belize. And what the blue hole is, it's about thousand feet wide and 406 feet deep, and it's a submerged cavern. So again, 20,000 years ago, this was a cave that was above the water, right? It was a land cave. And then as sea level rose, as we got warmer, because we're exiting the ice age, then this cavern got submerged into the ocean. And now, and the top collapsed, and we've got this incredible structure. And it's the blue hole, and it's within this incredibly diverse, beautiful reef. So how did we do that? Well, we took these two submersibles and we dove into the bottom. Incredible team to work with. It was on the Discovery Channel. You can still watch the dives. And so here I was getting into the sub for the first time to about to, about to go down um, into the bottom of the blue hole. So now I'm going to take you on a virtual like a little tour down. So as you're going down, this is the view out of the porthole of the sub. And we're going down, down, down. And we were diving two subs at the same time, which is so cool because it gives you perspective, right? And you're just going down. You know, if you're just looking out the window, you don't necessarily understand what you're seeing. But here, this is the other sub. And as we're descending, you can see the edge of the blue hole. And then here, I'm actually in this sub and someone took it from the other sub. And you can see just how huge these geologic structures are. Now, there's lots of stalactites in this um, in this blue hole because it was above land. So these are all these crazy geologic formations. You can actually see as sea level rose, you can see the level of like, and the striations of change within the blue hole. So here we are, we actually did some scuba dives. It's about 140 feet where you get to see these structures. What was so cool about doing the scuba dives along with the sub dives is it gave you this perspective of how big this structure was. We also were diving with lots of cool technology. So not just subs, we were using remote operated vehicles and getting them into like these little crevices that otherwise we wouldn't be able to explore. This was my favorite critter that we saw. So we did see some sharks and we saw a lot of fish, um, but this was a hermit crab. It was probably, you know, a quite big. It was in a conch shell and he had a standoff at around 300 feet with the yellow submarine. So here he was, he's like, you are in my territory, please get away. Um, and he had no clue what was going on, but it was my favorite. He just has had so much personality. We came, we just watched him in the lights for a few minutes. It was pretty neat. And then when you get to the bottom of the blue hole, there's very little oxygen. 
So you see things like dead conch shells and you see dead crabs and things that had fallen into the bottom and then they couldn't survive anymore because of the way that the, the, um, the water is the layers of water. There's very little nutrients and there's very little oxygen down below. So very, nothing can really survive down there. But this sort of changes a little bit of what we're seeing too, because when we were down there, not only did we see, you know, very little life, but we saw a lot of plastic. So here, as you can see, there's a scuba fin um, right here. And here's, there's a scuba fin and here's a Coke bottle, the, um, the telltale shape of a Coke bottle. And we saw a lot of plastic pollution. And everywhere you go in the ocean, you see a lot, I've seen a lot of plastic and a lot of signs of human impact. So it's something to think about, right? Everything that we do, you know, we have to make sure that we dispose of everything properly. We need to limit what we're using as much as possible. But now I'm going to shift gears, right? So that's just some of the cool expeditions. But now I'm going to tell you about my new project that's really exciting. And it's called Finding Feisty. And why is this project so exciting? Because it's been a lifetime in the making for me. So here I am next to a sperm whale down in Dominica. And I'm photographing this whale. And here, like eye to eye with a whale. So it's all about my personal connection with these incredible animals, which started when I was not even two years old. So there was a young whale named Feisty that stranded himself on the beaches of Long Island, where I grew up, and in New York. And they brought him into a boat basin. And this is the boat basin. As in, you can see, there were people that came and saw this young whale. So it was a young sperm whale that veterinarians and watermen and an entire community of different experts came and tried to rehabilitate this whale. So they thought this whale was going to pass away. They were going to bring it into this boat basin to try to, you know, just get him in a place where they could do like a necropsy if it didn't survive because he had stranded himself. He was clearly sick. And then they figured out that he had pneumonia and they gave him antibiotics and they were able to rehabilitate him in the nine days that he was in captivity and set him free. So I was not even two years old, but my mom, we lived really close and she took my brother and I there almost every day to see this whale. And I remember one moment in particular where he swam by me and he, we made this incredible eye connection. And I just fell in love with sperm whales. It was my first real experience that I connected with the ocean and understood that there was so much intrigue and mystery happening um, just beyond you know, where we could see. Now sperm whales live in really deep water. They eat giant squid and they're diving to great depths. And so to see one at the beach and this close in was very rare. And to be able to be that close to one, you know, in captivity, certainly rare, but just to be that close to one at a beach situation, so rare. But now fast forward to decades later, and I went back, to, I went into the water, I was trying to figure out, okay, I really want to tell this story about this little baby whale and how it inspired me for the future and the community. And I want to learn more about sperm whales. So I went down to Dominica, I got permits by the government from the government to go down and get in the water with these absolutely incredible animals. So, oh, here's a little video of being in the water with one of these whales. And you can see they're so expressive, it's so quiet, and they come up to you. And this whale in particular, it was one of our first interactions of our second trip to Dominica. And she and I just had this incredible mind meld and it was just this gentle dance in the water with this just incredibly large pregnant female. So it was just absolutely mind blowing to be in the water with this animal and have this experience. And this is all in real time. So she just kept swimming towards me and clicking on me. And really it felt like I was having a conversation with this whale, which was just mind blowing. So why is that? so cool well so whales these sperm whales actually live in matriarchal groups so the moms stay with the babies stay with the grandmothers forever creating these for their entire lives so they create these incredible communities that they protect each other and they work together and i was very fortunate because my mom brought me to see the sperm whale then and then she actually came with me on this expedition so here's that pregnant female that we saw they were sleeping here um but again, this is three generations of whales. And here, you know, just being next to them, absolutely incredible. 
making this eye connection. You just feel the wisdom that these whales have. And this they're curious about us and we are curious about them. And they chose to interact with us. We would just get in the water and they would swim to us. So back to the point of matriarchal, this is actually three generations of whales. So we've got, they admit funny names too. So this whale is named, her name is Fruit Salad. And then her daughter's name is Soursop. And then their baby is named Ariel. And I actually named the baby because they're in the unit A group. And Ariel happens to be my middle name. And so here's three generations of whales. And the little one is, she's about a year old and she's learning from the mom and the grandma and like how to interact with people and what to do. So she's got her mouth wide open as she's swimming towards us. You can hear the clicks as they're sizing us up. And they were very interactive because they knew they had known for the three generations of whales um, that people had been in the water with them studying them. So this is one of the better family groups first that has been studied very well. So just absolutely incredible, the moms and the babies and how they take care of each other. And Feisty, the young whale that I interacted with when I was a baby um, on Long Island that had stranded himself, should have still been with his mom. But instead he found this community of people to help him get well and then return to the wild. So just a few more pictures from Dominica. So I'm actually creating a film um, about sperm whales and about this called um, project called Finding Feisty. I'm really excited to bring it to you probably sometime in the fall. Um, and we're going to be actually going back to Dominica very shortly to do some more filming. This is actually the first picture, the first interaction I ever had with the sperm whale in the water. And it was so special. Um, then just fast forward. So now we're sort of like all stranded in one place. Very little exploration can go on. I'm very lucky to live by the ocean um, and get in the water with things like blue sharks um, where I live. But most importantly, I'm looking at, I'm doing another project about human impact. Right. So here is a lobster that was entangled in fishing line that I caught this summer. I was actually fishing for fluke, which is one of our local fish here to eat. And I snagged something off the bottom and I got this gravid female. You can see the eggs here. I pulled her up with all of this fishing line totally entangled in her and a weight. And there were jigs and all sorts of hooks. And then carefully I unhooked her and then we let her go so that she could actually have those babies. But not only that, we're finding all kinds of plastic and we're finding balloons. Please don't release balloons into the air because they just end up in the ocean, creating this really weird artificial habitat for things like baby crabs. But mostly they just stay in the ocean and create all kinds of problems. Sperm whales will eat these. Um, uh, turtles will eat them, fish will eat them, and it really creates a problem as they're floating around polluting our oceans. Also on the beach, I find a lot of toys. Um, here's a little Jeep that I have and Raphael, the, the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, and I have an entire collection of all sorts of animals um, and all sorts of toys from the beach. Um, but I always just like to say like, you know, you have to be really careful when you're you know, on the ocean and in the ocean or even anywhere to make sure that you dispose of all of your things properly, um, any waste, and to try to really limit your single-use plastic because we are seeing it everywhere in the ocean. I'm going to wrap up here with one of my favorite pictures I've ever took. This is in between a sperm whale drop and this flying fish just came shooting at us. And the fun thing about making films is I always have a camera rolling and I was able to capture this moment as we're ducking out of the way of this incredible fish. I'm so very fortunate to spend so much time in the ocean um, studying these incredible animals um, and learning about firsthand um, about all of these interactions and how important we really are as a global community and how everything that we do and how we interact with the ocean and each other does affect the ocean. So stuff we do on land, we really need to think of the ocean as our neighbor. So I'm going to um, stop sharing and go back to Joe and take any questions. All right, Galen, well, thank you so much for sharing some of those adventures with us. Um, that experience in the Blue Hole must have been just incredible. We, we hosted one of the submersible pilots, Erica Bergman joined us yesterday. Uh, and so she shared that adventure with us uh, in the past as well. And that sperm whale experience just, wow, looks absolutely amazing, amazing photos. I can see why you're so excited uh, <laughs> to get back to Dominica uh, and interact with uh, that family group again, just incredible. Yeah, no, it's it's one of those things I could just talk about forever. So I try to keep it <laughs> keep it brief. But yeah, it's, it's incredible. So hopefully we'll be doing some, you know, Instagram lives and things also while we're down there. 
Um, so bringing people along the, on the journey. So stay tuned. All right. Sounds great. So uh, those who are tuning in right now via Facebook uh, or YouTube, use that chat sidebar, send us in some questions and we'll work a couple of them in. Mm -hmm. But let's start with a question about, you know, looking at your career, you've been to the Arctic and the Caribbean and studying tuna. So it's been very, a varied career. Do you, how do you choose your next opportunity or does it choose you at this stage? So it's a combination. So sometimes I choose the, sometimes people come to me and say, hey, I've got this cool project. Or so for example, the Palau project, um, I had known one of the chief scientists, the PIs of that project. Um, and he came to me and said, hey, I've got this really cool project in Palau. Can you submit a proposal for a story that we could put together? And so they brought me into the project. Same with the submersible project in the Blue Hole. Um, Aquatica submarines brought me in to be a part of that expedition. Um, and then obviously the graduate work. So it's usually a collaboration. Sometimes I'll hear about a project and I'll reach out to someone and say, hey, I really want to tell this story. How can we make this work? And then obviously with the sperm whales and a lot of the wildlife stuff I do, it's either for a magazine pitch that I've done or, um, you know, with the sperm whale film is very much an independent project that I just really felt this was the right timing to tell the story. All right, let me just bring that up there. So we've got a question, where can they find? Uh, so Fallon's been joining all weekend long. Uh, this, uh, I think it's a family group has been joining us and they're wondering when uh, the documentary is released in the fall, where do you think people might be able to find it? So I think it will probably be released um, in film festivals to start out with. And then we're still working on the distribution. Um, the easiest way to stay within the loop is they can subscribe to my newsletter on my website, galenrosemax.com, or follow me on social media at Galen Go Explore. And that's where I'll be, um, you know, sending out the updates um, about where it will be. Um, also, I have a YouTube channel, which this film won't be on YouTube for quite a while, but I have other films. You can see the Coral film, and I have a Bering Sea um, series that I did and a bunch of fishing shows, um, fishing for science series that I created as well um, that they can check out. Um, but yeah, so I would say, yeah, via social media is usually the easiest. Um, and then there's also the trailer for the Finding Feisty film that they can see so they can see some more footage. Very cool. So um, you mentioned some past films. Is this current one your largest undertaking uh, or maybe just I guess maybe the one that means the most to you because it is an independent project? It's definitely my biggest undertaking um, to date. And I think it's mostly because it's largely my story as opposed to telling another story. And oftentimes I'll be within the story sort of as a communicator and someone is like the conduit to, um, to share the story. So sort of the voice or the narrator of the story we're telling, but this is actually very much about me and my personal journey. So it's definitely my biggest undertaking. It's also going to be the longest of any of the films that I've made. Um, and because it is, you know, I'm building the entire team as opposed to collaborate more collaborative. So, yeah, it's exciting. Right. Well, you have traveled the world exploring many parts of the ocean, um, but you see a lot of the impact that we're having, whether it's plastics, overfishing, um, climate change. Uh, we're curious about what gives you hope. Um, you know, when, when you see what you see, but um, obviously you get to work with a lot of great people who are, you know, on the other side, doing their best to raise awareness and, and tackle these problems. So what is it that gives you hope? So there's a lot of things that give me hope. I'm generally an optimist in regards to the ocean. So we've seen, you know, stories and we've seen things that have rebounded and done, you know, better. I think just right now, people's awareness of the problems going in the ocean is giving me the most hope. So people talking about, you know, less single use plastic, how their impacts, talking about alternative energies and things like that. I think when it's becoming more of a broad conversation, not just within our community, um, in the conservation community. Now it's sort of like in our general news cycle. I think that gives me hope. I also think that, you know, getting in the water with baby sperm whales, so that you're seeing the moms and the babies and you're seeing this cycle of life and that we're still getting, you know, there's still, it's still all happening, right? And I think that's also very helpful for me. Um, 
personally, I'm on the ocean a lot. And where I live in New York here, we've seen our bait fish come back in just tremendous numbers from tremendous conservation efforts. So to go out into our ocean where we would never see these fish called menhaden, which are very important to our ecosystem. They're a very oily, small fish. Um, and a lot of people call them bunker or pogies. And they are extremely important for whales and all of the different predators to eat. So everything from striped bass to the sharks and everything. And now we are seeing acres of them along our coastline. So you will literally be just looking off of your boat and just see so many. Or now we're seeing whales also right off of our beach, which growing up you would never think of. So these are conservation success stories from, you know, people getting involved and advocating and putting protections on these fish. So we have seen that with a little bit of help, we can, you know, create positive successes. So I think that, you know, when I'm, I literally was on my paddleboard this summer with whales lunge feeding around me. If you had told me that was going to happen five years ago, I would have been like, that's not possible. And instead, I was literally surrounded by fish with whales, and it was just mind blowing. Um, so I think that's kind of what gives me hope. And I think just so many great people are working on these issues. Um, yeah. All right. And I think you, you bring up a great point. The ocean is really resilient. And sometimes all we need to do is just give it some space uh, and it can rebound in just incredible ways. No, absolutely. Uh, yeah. One more question from the chat uh, before we let you go. Ming is wondering, how did you track the whales? How were you able to find them uh, on a regular basis? So in Dominica, there's a resident population of sperm whales. So they tend to hang out around the island. There's a river that comes out of a canyon and it's a very deep, um, a deep canyon. And there's a lot of giant squid and all sorts of crazy things living there. So the sperm whales are attracted to their feeding there a lot. But the, how we found them is actually with a hydrophone. So we would actually listen. Um, we'd go out on the boat um, just offshore and we put the hydrophone in the water and listen for the clicking of the whales because they're making noise as they're hunting, as they're swimming around, they're clicking and they're using codas. There's an incredible language of whales that's being studied um, with the sperm whales. Um, and so we would listen. And the best thing ever is when you hear those clicks and then you know, okay, well, there's whales down there. We may not see them yet, but they're going to come up because like us, they need to breathe air. So every 45 minutes or so, they pop back up and then we start looking for them on the horizon where we can get a good perspective of where they are using the hydrophone. So that's how we're finding them. It's all a listening game. Joe, you're muted. There we go. Uh, Galen, thank you so much for being with us uh, as we wrap up our festival. Thank you for sharing the incredible work that you're doing. And of course, thank you for doing that work uh, and then doing the outreach as well to reach students, uh, the next generation, and of course, the general public about oceans effect or issues affecting our ocean. Well, thank you so much for having me and congratulations on an extremely successful event. I'm honored to be a part of it. And I look forward to sharing my work some more in the future.